good family therapists need to be able to connect with every family member and create space for each to talk about the issue they face and how it impacts them. Family therapy is psychotherapy, designed to identify family patterns that may have contributed to behavioural or mental well-being concerns. The idea is to help family members break those habits by involving the family in discussion and problem solving. Every family member is given an opportunity to express their thoughts and how they feel about the issue affecting them. It involves the therapies working individually and with the family to resolve the issue which affects one or more family members. It can include working with the couple, parents, parent-child or even siblings in the family. It will be helpful if your family can attend therapy together. However, it is okay if not all family members turn up for therapy. Sometimes it involves family members discussing how to help an identified family member who has an issue but is not ready to come for therapy. I was inspired by my ex-boss. Okay? She is a family therapist herself. She's my mentor. And because of the exposure to family therapy work under her clinical supervision, it, I feel very inspired to pursue this as a career. I went through an intensive training for two years. I, I was um, being supervised um, behind a one-way mirror when I see the client and the family. Mm. So I have uh, supervisors um, calling in to tell me and give ideas how I can ask the different questions. Mm. And not only that, we have assignments, we have uh, project, we have discussion, uh, we have readings. So that comes up to about two years of work. Yes, yeah. So you need to be trained so that you feel equipped, you know, to help the family more effectively. It would be useful if, let's say, you start off with a bachelor, okay, and after which you pursue, you know, uh, your master's. Number one is uh, good listening skills and able to pick up the cues of what was not explicitly said. Sometimes I can sense uh, fear, uh, anxiety, confusion uh, or even um, a sense of lost. Yeah. So when I sense that it would be useful to feed back to the family so that they are more aware. And it is my role as a family therapist to be able to pick up all these unsaid messages that it's uh, in the family. Sometimes there is uh, the family is uh, not very ready to talk about uh, something that is toxic and difficult. Yeah. So I need to be able to sense, uh, hey, there is a white elephant in the family and this is not talked about. So I use this and feed back to the family yeah, so that they are more aware and hopefully more willing to tackle difficult issues and talk about it. So a good family therapist should be able to observe the dynamics of the family relationship and use it for therapeutic purpose. Yeah. For example, um, if I sense that there is too much cautiousness between a couple because they do not want to make things worse when they talk about difficult things. So I may, when I sense it, I want to feed back to the couple so that they are a little bit more relaxed yeah, and they can uh, alter their interaction pattern so that it's more productive discussion between them. Yeah, and it also helps them to understand each other and enhance the relationship. Mm. A good family therapist needs to be able to connect with every family member and create space for each to talk about the issue they face and how it impacts them. I connect with all family members at the start of therapy and this includes those who are not ready to be open. Often this is the family member who is identified as the issue. 
I use empathy to reflect and connect with a family member who feel forced to attend. I saw the idea that since he's here, let's make good use of time. And if he or, he or she does not want to participate, I respect his or her wish and inform that he or she can join the discussion anytime during therapy. I proceed with an interview with the family about the issue they face and invite the quarter ones to join the discussion from time to time. Sometimes, you know, uh, family finds it very difficult to hear and listen to each other. Okay, yeah. Especially when emotions are charged up. Mm, yeah, so they may need someone who is a neutral party to be able to facilitate them so that they can come to some kind of understanding of each other's concern and the issue that they're facing. Mm. And they may also need a bit of help in uh, coming up with some uh, solutions, uh, you know, problem solving. It would be good to have a third person to come in to facilitate that process. I recall a family that I work with and they have um, experienced a sudden loss of a family member. So I process their grief and help them sort out their thoughts and emotions. And some of them were experiencing self-blame. Okay? And they need their space to talk about their losses. Yeah. Um, and oftentimes, everyone is grieved over the sudden loss of a family member, but their journey can be slightly different from each other. I encourage them to comfort and support each other. I share with them the stages of grief and I help them make sense of their loss and explore ways to help them cope with the grief. After a number of sessions, the family were able to kind of move on, okay? And they were telling me they, they take a family holiday together, yeah. They were able to concentrate at work, yeah. They are a little bit more at peace, okay, with the, with the, the blame that they experience, yeah. And I see that they were able to give support to each other, yeah. And they are able to give kind words, uh, encouraging words to each other, yeah. So I feel that um, the sessions has given them a space to talk about their losses earlier on. I usually try to find out as much as possible about the cultural background of the family before the session starts. And I will use the session to explore the family's culture and the beliefs surrounding the culture. I take an interest in the meaning, the story, worldview and narrative of the cultural beliefs. I explore how the cultural beliefs impact the individual's family and relationship. Yes, I do the same generationally because a different generation, they may have different uh, beliefs. Like for example, Generation Y and Generation Z, they may have very different values. Yeah. So it's good to, to use this to talk about the different values and how it impacts their lives. Yeah. To, to help them come to some kind of understanding about each other. And we, and we also talk about how do we then deal with the different values in the family. It is common to have different worldviews because especially when you are dealing with uh, a family with different generations, parents, teens, children, you know. Yeah. So uh, I think it's useful to talk about it and be able to draw it out, get them to listen to each other, get them to see how these values are affecting them and the family as a whole. Mm. Usually my approach is that I, I would facilitate the session in such a way that everyone needs to feel heard and validated. Mm. I demonstrate neutrality unless it involves risk or harm to the family members. But having said this, it also depends on the issue. It may not always be possible to have a balance in terms of needs. Let me give you an example. If a family member is expected to sacrifice his need for happiness, by following the family culture of marrying the family's choice partner than his choice of a life partner. 
So this stand may not be very therapeutic to try and balance everyone's needs. So I would usually encourage the family member to assert and negotiate with the family. Mm. Yeah. So my role is to create that safety so that the family member can talk about his difficulty or her difficulty with the family. I like that question and uh, you see I usually would respect the power imbalances in the family between parents, children and teens. Yeah. My take is that parents have parental authority over their children and teenagers. However, I want to encourage family members to say what they think and feel because it's very suffocating if you're unable to say how you truly feel or think. So sometimes it requires me to move my chair closer to the family member to engage the quieter ones or the person who is identified as the issue. And then with spouses, I may sometimes direct the conversation to the quieter spouse. Okay? Yeah, so this is to make sure that every spouse, everyone has a chance to say how he or she thinks and feels. Mm. I would give space for each person to talk. I facilitate that process. And I would also encourage the family to give a listening ear okay, to each other. So sometimes I may uh, have a conversation about how do we paraphrase, reflect feelings, okay, so that uh, every family member feels heard and validated. In the session, I would share my observation about the strength, areas of growth in the family. When I observe certain interaction pattern, I would feed back to the family. Example, uh, whether they are listening or interrupting each other. I will ask, what do they need from each other? Is it about acknowledging what has been said? Okay. And I will ask them, what are they prepared to do? Okay. Is it to render support? Is it to not interrupt when someone is talking? Mm. So I would also share with them skills in managing conflict, such as let's focus on the issue at hand, okay? Let's uh, KIV the past issues so that we can actually use the time more productively. It has happened before. So sometimes I will, I will ask, does this happen at home? Okay, because it's an enactment of what is happening at home. Yeah, okay. So then I would use that and, and, and feedback to the family. Hey, is this how you want to use the time here in therapy? Or would you rather have a calmer conversation so that it is uh, an opportunity for you to hear each other? Okay, yeah. Do you want to learn? Do you want to have a calmer conversation with your family member or with your spouse? Mm, yeah. So I may have to set certain rules. Yeah, if I find that it is difficult to, I mean, the conversation is not helping, you know, uh, and it is not therapeutic. Mm, that's again a very good question. If I notice that, then sometimes I would want to be that voice for that person. I would be asking very uh, tentative questions. Example, are you afraid if you say this? Okay. And uh, would you feel safer, suppose, if, if we were to just have an individual conversation? If this is so, then I would excuse the family for that uh, maybe half an hour while I engage in a conversation with the individual. They will wait at the reception and then I will check in with the individual whether uh, certain information, uh, would you like me to keep it in confidence or would you like me to share with the family? And even in seeing a family, sometimes um, it is the call uh, from the family therapist to decide whether you want to then see them separately, okay? Example, see the parents talk about how to handle the teen if let's say the teen is not responding and keeping quiet during the whole sessions. So it doesn't mean that it has to be seeing every family members in the family therapy session. I may start off with that but it is the discretion of the family therapist to decide what is most useful when we look at the subsystem. 
I usually would encourage the family to come for about at least um, four to six, yeah. And, uh, and, but again, it depends on their time and commitment. Yeah, sometimes it's not very easy to bring every, everybody together. Yeah. And there are some families, after seeing me for three sessions, they feel that they have enough resources to get going. Yeah. So if this is the case, then I usually respect their wish. Yeah. Uh, but of course, I think commitment in working on the issue is it's important. Mm -hmm. It is successful when families feel that there's a space to talk about what they think or feel about the issue. It is successful when the goals set by the family are clear and they are met. It is successful when the family is committed to work on the issue and attend the sessions.